Live. Thank you all for joining us. This is the CCA afternoon with Ron Lane. We're going to be talking to the man who has really set himself up over the years to be the leader in kayak fishing sales in Southern California. I've been part of uh, Fast Lane since uh, before I was doing anything else aside from being in high school. So um, today we're going to listen to a little bit of what Ron's story uh, has had. Uh, his long history in the fishing industry in Southern California, and uh, gets into a little, you know, a couple good uh, uppercuts and questions to him, along with your questions out there. Um, so for those of you joining, please uh, ask away, and we'll get to a question or two as we go through our interview. And thanks for joining. Um, so Ron Wayne, you've been around the industry for in the fishing industry before you even sold kayaks, but I would say that a lot of people know you for the kayaks. What really is the story, is your story on the shop? Is, it, is that part of the story? Is that all of your story? Like, what is, what is it that you've done in the fishing industry? Well, whenever you're on the water, fishing is a big part of it. So for years, we've been surfing, sailing, you know, selling sailboats and having all kinds of water toys. And fishing is a big part of that. From when we, from the early, earliest times I can remember, I go surfing or camping at a place. And then all of a sudden we're jumping on the surfboards and paddling out and catching fish. So it's a natural for us to fish on things. Now, we sold all kinds of sailboats for years, maybe 20 years. Debbie and I had a store before we started selling kayaks. Now, when Hobie came out, with you know a kayak, we were interested because you always put kayaks on your sailboats and you can use them as little, you know, little crafts to get to the water, get from the boat to the beach. Now, an interesting thing happened. Now we're fishing out of kayaks all the time, but all of a sudden, Ketterman designed the Mirage Ride. Game changer. <laughs> and pretty, pretty soon after that, uh, we got real involved because if you can have your hands free sitting in a kayak, you can fish and you can go further and you can do it easier and faster. And then all of a sudden they're selling like hotcakes and it hasn't stopped 20 years of outbacks and pro anglers and all these, you know, it's just amazing the technology and the way it has progressed. It's turned a little niche, you know, fishing thing, fishing on plastic little boats. It turned it into a full-on, I, I mean, what do you call that? It's definitely a strong part of the fishing industry. I, I, fact, I heard a, a fact that the largest growing part of the kayak industry was kayak fishing, which makes sense to me. And then I heard that it's also the largest part of the fishing industry. So two industries really affected by the Mraz Drive. And I really think that the Mirage Drive was key in this because if you're paddling and trying to fish, it's just not as easy as paddling a Mirage Drive through the water. So that affected us. The sailboats were on their way out. It just wasn't as popular as it was in the 70s and 80s. But then kayaking came along and oh my goodness, now we've got all these incredible Hobie products that fit the beginner, that fit the 
the, the expert. I'm sitting in right here in the shop. I'm sitting in a, a Hobie 360. Oh my goodness, who would have ever thought they'd go any direction? Well, what that does for you if you're on a shoreline in a lake is amazing. So I don't want to go long on that question, but I got to tell you, this, this kayak fishing thing has really changed our business over the last 20 years. And it's just super fun. I'd love to floor some questions. Okay. Yeah, right now we're just getting some people in and um, we'll get to the questions, I'm sure. Um, we're doing a little bit different in interview style where instead of having someone behind a computer, we're actually in Ron's shop and he's in the middle of making sales going on right now. So um, it's, it's fun to be here. Um, we are six feet, but I think we're about 10 feet apart from each other. So it's, um, it's just nice to be able to be around and, and see you in the action, see your operation in action. Um, <laughs> So, you know, you, you are involved in CCA, you're a lifetime member, um, and, you know, it's, it's been how many years do you think you've been involved with CCA? Ooh, I'm going to have to guess on that one, Kevin, about four years, I think. Pretty close yeah. to the beginning. Yeah, well, the guys were doing picnics and, you know, different boat shows, and I, I, I caught wind of it, and I just, you know, my good friend Pete Gray from Let's Talk Hookup. He was telling me about it, and many of the guys that are involved in a lot of the industry things talk about CCA, so I was curious to see what was going on, and when Steve Pinard, my next-door neighbor over here at the Bait and Tackle, said, Ron, you got to be in this thing. We, got, we need protection, and I'm going, God, that's right, because I don't have time to study these things and, you know, call council members and to know the right guys, so... I felt so good that I have a, a group of guys that, that I know from the fishing industry that are trying to protect what we think is so important, which is our fishing rights, That's our right. ability to go fishing and to not have a bunch of useless rules put on us. And, and I got to tell you, the MLPA thing, I think is it, it, these rules just come on us and then they never stop to see if there's any effect. They never change them. They just always limit things. So we need a group. We need a group of guys like the CCA is doing. And I've watched some of the things they're doing. I've talked to you about it. I've talked to many people. And I'm glad the CCA is, is here in Southern California. And, and we have an advocacy. Advocacy? Adv advocacy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so, it's so important to have guys that are involved doing the, you know, as mouthpieces for us. It makes me feel good. And all I got to do is donate. What the heck? That's easy. And There's a lot that they do with the, oh. all the funds from every single membership platform, including the mm -hmm. annual, the $35. And it helps protect what we have in the future in California. And we're not alone out there in the States. You know, there's Louisiana um, and all the Gulf, Gulf Coast is really heavily involved with their protection of their regulations and, and being out there to voice their opinion as fishermen in a very muted, uh, in very muted industry. How do you, um, how would you, how would you, how would you even think to complain to California? I mean, <laughs> what? <laughs> I what don't even know where to start. Have interview. <laughs> God. This is That's just, why we need people like you. This is madness. The yeah, well, we do need we do need guys out there listening to talk to their friends and join. I think it's important. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have so many things to work on in our neck of the woods. You know, not talking about nationwide, but in the political world, in the fishing political world, we have so many um, areas to help ourselves and. Want you to just kind of let people know how do you think a regular person can help the the community become a better advocate for the sport? Oh, I I got to tell you, Kevin, I rely totally on CCA to do that. I I wouldn't even know how to. I mean, I do know Scott Sherman from fishing out of kayaks. Yep. And and I have talked to him, and and you know he is you know, help with lifeguards and things, especially when they have the close down. But I think a normal fisherman is going to have a rough time trying to find how to stop something in his area from happening. And that's why you need larger groups like the CCA. 
Awesome. Um, we have a couple people that had a comment, um, and uh, I want to get through some of those really quick, if you don't mind. I've got to open them up. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask a question that I have pre-written down here, and uh, that is, how has kayak fishing changed Southern California, or sorry, sport fishing in Southern California? Um, good and bad, if there's any bad. But, okay, <laughs> that's a really good question, and I'm, I'm the guy, because when you, when you think about most kids around the area, like the, you know, the Groms, call them the Groms. They're fishing off of rocks and docks. And then they're looking out in the water and they're going, gosh, if I just had a way to get right out there, I'd be, I could have more access. Well, kayaks have just increased the access to waterways, I mean, in a good way. Here you've got a, a, an incredible little boat that you can pedal and fish off of so that that kid doesn't need a skiff, doesn't need a power boat. He can just be, instead of standing on the rocks and the docks, he can be out pedaling around. And I know a lot of float tubers are out there and they're going, gosh, if I, if I just had, a, you know, like the rocks and docks kids want a float tube, then the float tube guy wants a kayak, then the kayak guy wants a skiff. And, and, and I had uh, Bart Hall from um, the, the Fred Hall shows, all, all those shows for years. And, and one of the Fred and, his, and uh, Bart said to me one time, he goes, you know, it's like that, it's like that guy that walks in and he wants the boat that's just the next size up. He goes, at my show, they can come into the boat show and that and that guy can get the next boat bigger and the next boat bigger. And then pretty soon when he gets all the way up to the biggest boat, he gets older and then he has less friends, so he needs the next boat smaller and the next boat smaller. And pretty soon he's in a kayak again because he has no way to go with. And I, and and Bart was Bart bragging, bragging about how, how going, man, man, they all they need all me. me. So, so everybody, everybody needs that boat show. And I'm thinking that's so funny that the more guys that buy kayaks, the more guys that get involved in fishing and kayaks, you know what that means? That means that all those powerboat guys are going to be selling powerboats soon. I know when you started kayak fishing, it wasn't the end. I mean, I have a powerboat. I have kayaks. Every, this thing just keeps marching right up the scale. And at some point we're going, well, maybe I don't need that big a boat anymore. Yep. I'm there. I already got the power boat. I've been upscaling since then too. <laughs> so you're as guilty as I am. I am. Definitely. I am guilty. Hey, but let me ask you a question, Kevin. Uh huh. When, when you were a high schooler and you could think of going out to the ocean and launching, going through some waves and going catching yellowtail. How attractive is that? How fun is that? You just can't think of anything else. It, it was the way to get off the bank. And, and that's uh, for a young guy or any person really who's trying to get away from being on shore their entire fishing life. It is the first time you get to really have your independence away from land. And so for some people it's I guess that's what they want and, and I can't argue because I love bank fishing. I grew up doing it, but when you're finally able to get off onto the water, the bank, it just, it's a freeing feeling. You feel like you can go anywhere you, you want. And that's, that's why it attracted me. And it was cheap to be realistic. Well, and now you're, and now you've taken that next step and you're hooked on fishing. And so the next step is, well, either the bigger kayak or the power boat and it just keeps on getting better and better. That's right. That's why your, your sales are such a success is because there's a lot of people like in the situation that I was in. Well, there, want to get yeah, off the and there's more to this than just a kayak. I mean, I was cracking up. I listened to you on the radio the other day and you said, somebody said something about, oh, kayaks are great for bird watching. And I'm, I sat there thinking, well, the whole time I'm out fishing, I'm bird watching. <laughs> and you and Morgan were talking about, we watch birds the whole time we're fishing. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. Said, yeah, you see a lot. It's quiet. It's fast. And one of the things that people discount is that you're basically out there exercising and it's all disguised. You're disguising your exercise with fun. So you actually do it. How many guys do you know that got a kayak and they dump some LBs? All right. Perfect.
year. Wow. We got a written yeah, letter from him. It was pretty amazing. Um, so Dave Brody, who you know, um, he, he comments on Fastlane is such a good name for your company. Oh, that's funny. But Debbie, <laughs> Debbie and I used to sell catamarans and we kind of prided ourselves on selling the fastest catamaran. Debbie was a sail maker and I was a catamaran racer. You know, when the, when the wind's up, the surfing's not good, so I'd go sailing. But anyway, uh, we, we moved down to San Diego and we started a store and we had to figure out a name. And um, that, that tune from, I don't know, Life in the Fast Lane was out. And one of the, one of the employees of Prindle Catamarans said, well, you gotta name it Fast Lane. Cause you guys sail fast. And, and I said, done, wasn't much thinking, but that's why we did it. Awesome. Um, I have another question here. Um, this is uh, when I wrote down and it says, uh, who would not like kayak fishing? Probably the only, I mean, in the store, we have a lot of time guys come in, you know, with their buddy. And their buddy may, might have a power boat or something and he'll look around and kind of just cross his arms like this and go, oh, that looks like too much work to me. <laughs> and, and, and I think that a typical guy would say something like that if he hasn't tried it. Once you go out with a buddy and you're pedaling along, you know, nice glassy day off of La Jolla and you're seeing yellowtail start to you know, break, maybe a bird or two following them and you come on it and all of a sudden you're on a bike. Who doesn't like that? Nobody. Right. Everybody's going to like that. It can be from, you know, extreme, you know, fishing out, uh, you know, for big yellowtail. How about just a calico bite off the edge of the kelp beds? Cartwheeling calicos. Who couldn't love that with a stick bait? Oh, that's just like the funnest. Now, I'm going to tell you, um, I've been caught ditching work, rolling a boat right down behind the store here, going out and catching spotted bay bass. And I absolutely love fishing spotted bay bass because it's so fun. And so, you know, you'll go out in, in two hours and catch, you know, a whole bunch of spotted bay bass. And it's just, I don't know what makes it. If you can answer that question, you're probably on your way to your first million. <laughs> Why is spotted bay bass fishing so fun? It just is. Well, I'm glad that you offer a, a feature at your shop where people can go out and try it and they can do uh, what's called a fishing mission with you where they go out on the water, they test out their kayak, a Hobie kayak with a rod and rod in their hand and they go after spotties. And I gotta tell you, that's- done that since 2012. So it's been a long time. We, we've done that a long time. And I got to tell you, when I got that idea, I remember calling you and I said, what do you think? And he just said, I'm in. I want to be the guide. <laughs> that first time we experimented with that idea, it was in the middle of winter, Kevin. Yeah, December. I had a whole bunch of models of boats left over from the year before that I wanted to sell before the end of the year. And we just put them all in the water and took people out fishing. They were gone in a week. Yeah. And that light bulb went on. Well, I'm glad that you do it. Well, if somebody gets in a boat, if somebody gets in a boat, they're going to like it. Yeah. So who wouldn't like it? That's right. Um, we have a comment here or a question, actually. And it's from Arnie. And he asks, what do you think is the next innovation coming to the kayak world? And the question is to both of us, but we'll start with you. You know, um, it, for the last three years, um, space, availability, storage, uh, motor homes, and yachts. These are, these are people who want kayaks. And big boats like a pro angler are difficult to load on top of a motor home or load in a yacht. So I really think inflatables are going to be a thing of the future. We tested that theory for the last five years with the I-11 series. That's our, one of our favorite boats in the Hobie line. It's an inflatable 11 foot uh, kayak with a Mirage drive in it and a comfortable seat. And those things are just marvelous. They blow up in minutes, easy to store in a, an apartment 
or you, you put them in smart cars, you know, that it's, it's, I think that's a, a thing of the future. I think going lighter, lighter weight boats and, and inflatables is going to be a nice, I, I think that's going to be a nice niche. I agree. I think that space is a big question for a lot of people. Not everyone owns a home and um, a place to store their boat even, right? And, a, and really, uh, if you can nail down eliminating, taking up 12 foot of space that's dedicated to our plastic boat, you've opened up 11 more feet of the space that only a one foot inflatable build up would take. So I think, I think that inflatables are really um, the way of the future when it comes to personal watercraft, small watercraft. Um, and I think they're only going to get better. The technology is there to improve it. And uh, it's just going to be a very uh, big challenge to get people to overcome the fact that it's inflatable. And to get really scared sometimes the fact that it punctures or whatever. Well, I, no, that's truly true. That, the, overcoming that, uh, oh, I don't want an inflatable. Is that because you haven't tried it? <laughs> is that what do you know about it this is you know and, and so one of the one of the things that we've had to overcome is that you know people they they're nervous about being way out in the water well there's ways to get around that mm -hmm. a good life jacket three chambers <laughs> <laughs> so i wouldn't be afraid of it and and definitely the boats have gotten better um so uh, Wayne asked, what fish finder, GPS, uh, maybe a combo of both, do you recommend for bay and inshore? I'm guessing, I'm assuming on a kayak. Yeah, well, the, the one that, you know, I've been using is just the split shot hook 2.5 reveal. And I love that new card in it with the Navionics. So I use that one mostly. Now, I have been, you know, the glasses I have needed to get a little bigger screen in the last few years. And so that, that, that hook seven or no, the reveal seven. Reveal seven. Yeah, yeah. With the, with the split shot. well, uh, but I've been back. We've been because of the outback and the pro angler having the, that guardian that, that, I mean, it's state of the art, a transducer, you know, it's the way you the way you put it in the bottom of the boat it just is amazing how it lifts up in the boat and protects that transducer so i've been going back and forth now the question i have for you kevin is how many fish can you remember that you caught that you wouldn't have caught if you didn't if if you know the triple shot between the split shot having the side oh, scan the side scan's a big deal it's it's the, for me it's more for getting bait than it is for yeah. anything else. Okay. So if I can see the, the where the bait schools are and I can move around and totally, if, if I'm over you know 100 feet away and then I can see there's bait over 100 feet away, I can turn left and I can literally go on top of them. And it's it's like having an acoustic sounder or side scan on a boat, right? You can see tuna around that, you know, 300 feet around you. And that's, that's just an unfair advantage for sure. So I so you so it. you're sold on it. Oh yeah. The, the, Side scan uh, imaging is, that is one of the biggest uh, techno technological advances in recreational fishing in my opinion. So, so when I go in the bay here and I'm using my, my triple shot is what Lawrence yep. calls it. So when I have it set up and it shows 60 feet out, am I gonna be seeing uh, any structure? What am I seeing out there? I mean. It's hard, like when I go by a pier, I can see pylons, yep. you know, but it's not, I'm not real clear of what I'm looking at. Um, how does, I mean, how does that work for you when you're in the bay versus like when you're in a lake? Well, it depends on uh, the depth. So if you're super deep, it's very hard to get a good reading. If you're really shallow, it's very easy to get a good reading. So the lake guys really like it. Oh, yes. And bait. Bait's very good. And oh. even offshore or, you know, inshore for us. So you know, you're seeing water. bait 60 feet out mm -hmm. on your side scan. Crystal clear. Oh, I'll be darned. That's good. You know what? And I've, I've been torn between those two, and I've used both a lot. And, you know, we've gone through several boats because we've ran out of boats so many times. I had to sell mine. Mm -hmm. And then I set up a new one, and I, it just depended on what finder I had in stock. 
That was a good question. Um, let's get to uh, some of the, one of the uppercuts I was just telling them about. And, um, you know, I think this is all gonna hit home with you uh, and, and certainly with other people in the kayak fishing community because they were a part of this when it was happening, but um, we're half of this question. It is, uh, do you feel like the MLPA or AB 3030 has or will affect your business? Oh, it, it definitely does. I yeah, said when, when MLPA first came out, um, I had people coming in. Oh, how? Oh, that, sorry, Ron, that they closed all the bay and they, I mean, they closed all that area out there. I go, they didn't. There, there was so much misunderstanding that it, it just kind of, I, I don't, where'd you read that? You know? So I think communication has just been whack on that. I, I really think, I, I really think we need advocates to change that or test it or how, is that MLPA even working? How would we know? We've had the best fishing in years. So I don't, I don't see how, why do they still do it? Why can't they take it off and test to see if it goes down? And I don't really see it as being accurate. And I think every time they make rules, they only make more. They don't make less. They don't want less. So I, I feel really bad that we have to defend our fishing rights. Who's, who likes, who's gonna protect fishing more than anglers like us? We want it to be good. I mean, you could do that. You could protect the fishery so much better than just closure. Right. Limits. Limits, yeah. Let them fish, but don't, you can't take them. Right. I mean, there's, you can have such better rules. And, and, you know, we have such an appreciation for our fishery that we, we could almost monitor ourselves with education because some people just don't get it. <laughs> right. Well, some people, but that's why, that's why getting a news outlet out there that can help educate people is a really important way of oh, I understanding agree what might be out there and what's under everyone's radar. Because certainly a lot of these headaches have been way under people's radar. So, really so this new one that's coming out that we just got a little bit of a reprieve on the mm -hmm. 30, 30, I think that is horrible. That could affect hunting, fishing, sportsmen all over California. And it could be bad because once that goes on, you're not going to get that off. Right. We got to fight that tooth and nail. Anything we can do. Right. What's well, it's, uh, it's been delayed for just the small, right currently, the short period until maybe next year. So it's time to rise up and to get people to know what it is. Speak on how you can help fight it. And uh, I think a lot of that education comes with what CCA puts out there. So to all you watching, you should definitely do your research on what AB 330 is and also learn more about how you can be at a CCA event to hear what it's about. Because that's what you're going to hear from a person who's, who's from people who read it, who know exactly where they're going with and uh, how they're going to take it to the Capitol and how it proceeds when it's up in the Senate. And I think that if you're part of it and you're part of the process, you get to become a lot more effective in combating those attacks on your freedom. Um, Arnie asked a question. He said, how would you fit a fish finder to an island? Well, the, the Hobie catalog has uh, a little kit for attaching the transducer to the rudder. We took it one step further and built a plate that goes onto the deck. And when you lock the seat down on the, the boat, mm -hmm. it, it makes the plate steady, pulls it rock solid. What's it's the plate ma made out? It's made out of starboard. You know, oh, really? That plastic board. It, like it's just like a cutting board material. It's very light, yeah. It's black, it matches the seat, it looks good. And then we put our rod holders, we put you know the transducer holder, and now that the new lithium batteries are out that weigh one pound, they have a little Velcro strap on them. We just hook that to the back of the seat. So it just takes minutes to outfit it with, with That's awesome. a nice rocket launcher style. Is it portable? Yeah, very portable. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. it comes in like pieces or panels? 
And it's just one panel. Oh, one panel. Okay. Yeah, it, wor it works great. That's we've, awesome. we've sold gobs of them. Okay. We have them in stock. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Sounds like a few of you guys are looking for I-11. Um, I-11 accessories can come down here at Ron Shop and take a look at one of them. Do you have one outfitted right now? No, not outfitted, but we have the plate. Okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, that was one of the uppercuts. Here's the next one. Do fishing or do politics and fishing mix? <laughs> Seems like politics is in everything now. And I keep asking people, when is that going to end? And they, they all go, November. This will all be over in November. <laughs> anyway, I, I, I don't, you know, I think fishing is just such a, a passionate sport. And the, fish, the guys that are in it, when they see things going wrong, I mean, how do you fight it? So I feel helpless. And I, I really, when I first joined CCA, I said, man, I feel less guilty now. I have you guys to help me not be stupid. <laughs> I want to be involved, but I just don't have the time. So knowing that I can join CCA and that those guys have me as a sportsman's back, and actually I'm, I'm, I'm involved in that industry, so it, it's a living too. I'm glad CCA is around, and I think they're doing good work. But does it mix? I think I think I don't know how that that's an uppercut. I don't know how to answer. <laughs> you know, would you would you go out there on the water and make it your first thought to think about something? Um, let's not even say uh, you know like the fishing legislative side of things, but even what's out there in the regular politics. Would you take that on the water with you? No. Yeah. When I go on the water, come on, Kevin. I just went fishing with you. We get that's our that's our freedom. That's our our way we get away from it all. I don't think of anything but the moment when I'm out there. And I've caught you being on a fish, looking for another one. I've seen you do that. I just I don't want to swivel. He's fishing. He's catching one, and he's looking for the next one. Yeah, I, I just love that. And it's such a great way to get away from all of this madness. So, 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 so yes, well, no. I think we need to be political. But when I'm on the water, that's the last thing I'm thinking about. I'm enjoying, I'm, you know, there's a Salty Crew t-shirt that says, find refuge in the sea. Got to tell you, that's, that's me. Yeah. When I'm out there, I'm not in here. <laughs> So um, Dave asked a question and it was about Salty Crew. Can you give some people the, uh, the background of what Salty Crew is? Because they may not understand the, the family relation oh, between yeah, yeah. what yeah. fastlane is you and Salty Yeah, Crew. well, uh, my two sons and I have fished together since we were paddling little surfboards out and fishing off of our surfboards after a day of surfing. And so fishing has just always been something we do. Well, these guys, my sons, Jared and Hayden, grew up here in the shop, you know, partially homeschooled, partially, you know, at school, but they were always around here, fishing off the dock, running around in kayaks when they got old enough. When I first launched Hayden in a kayak, he didn't even sink it enough to keep it from wobbling back and forth. He was so light, it, but he could pedal it. So. You know, they, we just always fished. And then what's next? Well, all of a sudden they're going, what's these t-shirts? Let's make these salt, salty t-shirts with a couple hooks on them and a fish. And Hayden painted this picture of a white sea bass and they put it on a hat and it sold like crazy. So that's how Salty Crew started. Just from these little surfer kids at the fish. Yeah, Jared and Hayden. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. and it's it's really been it's really been fun for me because they've just taken it to another level. I their their business is so big now that it's crazy. I see them running around like today they were running around with a bunch of surfers, fish. Tomorrow they go fishing for blue Wayne Diego, you know, out and they were surfing this morning up at you know Oceanside riding longboards. So yeah, it's surfing and fishing, and it's just something they've always done. And so that brand is just their lifestyle and that's kind of fun that's uh, amazing that they took it where it was and i remember when hayden was making hand planes 
Yeah. That, that was Sultan Grill. Yeah, him and Callan. Yeah. That's right. In a garage, and they were making hand planes for surfing and, or hand planing surf. That's right. That's right. So it's uh, it's gone to the way next level. Like the, yeah. Uh, I don't even know where it goes from there, but I'm sure that you have, they have big plans. Well, they they do have big plans, and it's just it never ceases to amaze me. <laughs> um, let's see what else we got here in the uh, comments. And uh, we'd like to thank everyone out there watching and, and participating. Thank you for joining us. It is a, a rare opportunity to have Ron in front of a live stream. So <laughs> yeah, I think my first time. Oh, is it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Well, you'll get to see what it's like on the other end <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> for a while. <laughs> um, so if you have one recommendation to someone who's not a kayak fisherman and wants to think, wants, wants to think, not actually thinking, but wants to think about getting out on the water, what would their next step be? What would your first step be to get getting off the bank? If you've never even thought of that before. No, that's a really good question. And a lot of our clients, you know, had that question for us. You know, they'd be at a boat show or looking at all the products, you know, which one do I want? What, if I go kayak fishing, what do I need? How do I get started doing this? Is kayak fishing the first step to take? Is that is that what you're implying? Is it the oh you mean uh, so if someone's never thought about getting off the bank before, oh. what is their first thought? Where should their first thought go? What's their first what's the first trip they should take? Wow, that's an uppercut. Because for us, if we're going on the water. We take a rod, but there's been many times Debbie and I have just gone out touring, paddling around. Being on the water is, you know, it's so amazing. And the way the boats move through the water, particularly in the evening or in the morning when it's glassy. So, but back to that question, if you're thinking of getting a kayak, one, don't stop, just get on that. Whether you have to go rent one, go try one, go demo one, whatever you do, just try it. I really think it's one of the toys of San Diego that's just gonna keep growing and growing because think about all the waterways we have that you can explore. How can you get on the water quietly with a little bit of exercise, just the right amount of exercise? It's like taking a walk on the water. It's so easy to do. You just, I think, to get, just get going, just go buy one. And it doesn't really matter if you buy a Hobie because they're, they hold their value so well, you can trade them in and just go to the next step. Right now you might be able to upsell. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, it's funny you say that, is that uh, guys are selling their kayaks for what they bought them for a few years ago because of the demand is so high. Yeah. A little bit like that bike shop scenario with this COVID thing. Mm -hmm. It's just like bikes, anything outdoors is gone. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we have no use, but I just traded one in today. So we have a pro angler available. There you go. It probably won't last long. <laughs> no, it won't. Um, let's see. We um, have a question from Wayne. This is going to take up all the rest of the time that we have, but maybe we'll see. Um, compare the outback with the passport, with the compass, with the front end. Oh, you compare some of all of them? Yeah. What, I, I mean, that's, that's a really good question, and we get asked that daily. So that's that's a really good question. Now, if if you are looking for the best kayak to get, if you're looking for the number one kayak, I think Pro Angler Outback. And those are going to be in that 3-4 range. Okay. You can't go wrong with them. They probably will cost you the same when you've owned them for a few years because you can resell them and the amount it costs you is going to be very little. Probably the same as on a passport or a compass. Okay. Now, when you maybe aren't so sure what you want, maybe you're, you're not really like, Do I, am I going to like this? Just go buy a passport. They're very inexpensive. They're an introductory boat. You can probably get a passport for less you can buy a used outback. So 
you get started and it's working and you're fishing and you're loving it. You're, you're starting to get a little exercise and you're pulling that belt size a little less because you're getting some exercise that's been disguised. Then you just come trade it in. It's so easy to do. You just come in and say, the guy today was actually trading in a pro angler for an outback because his, his vehicles have changed and he wanted to downsize a little better to make it a little easier. It's easy to do. So I would just get started on it. Now, when you think about the four steps there, passport, compass, outback, pro angler, they're all very, they're priced pretty equally as these jumps go up. As, you, as these steps go up, your price goes up. But now, the, this one right here, the Outback, if you buy an Outback, you'll never be disappointed. You'll never have to add to it. You'll probably want to add to it to go to the Pro Angler, but that is the boat that I would start with. The Outback is the one to start with. I think so. Okay. It's got everything. You don't have to add anything. It's It's been built for over 20 years. They've added new things, you know, many times. But when they remodeled it, when they re, we had a guy today drive two hours to come here to buy an Outback. He couldn't find one anywhere and he had to have it. First kayak. And he knew that from all the research. He's one of those guys who just research, research, and research. The more research you do, the more you're going to buy an Outback or a Pro Angler. Right. Okay. That's a, that was a, I think that was a pretty good answer. I would have said, I would have said start with a Pro Angler because you're never going to get out of a Pro Angler. <laughs> you know, it, um, yes and no. I fish both of them a lot. Uh, one of the reasons I like that Outback is just the, the spontaneity of it. Uh, not so much stuff, just a quick, quick strike. And I can afford to have both. <laughs> but if I had one, it would be a pro angler, Kevin. There you go. So the Outback is where you'd start. If you had to choose one for yourself, you would do a pro angler. Oh, my favorite is the pro angler. Pro angler 14, all the way. Okay. Um, Graham asks, how deep of a scratch on the bottom of the kayak do you need to be worried about? Uh, when you feel water coming on the other side, that's it. <laughs> Okay, uh, they, can, they can handle a lot then. They do, and it's amazing how thick they are. And um, there's this really cool little uh, welding kit. It's called the Casey Welder. Hobie has it all set up, and you can fix scratches really easy. Um, I, and if you, if you want to do this, come by the welder, and I'll give you some kayak material that we can put big scratches in, and you can practice repairing it. It's a, it's a, that's a really good question, actually. And the next question um, was, do you repair dings on a modern kayak like you do on a surfboard and you just answered Absolutely it? no, no. No? Well, no. with the Casey Welder, you would be able to do it. It's you can, like you can fix, yeah, they're completely different. Right. Uh, nothing sticks to super linear polyethylene. Right. But you can put things on surfboards to fix them and seal them. Mm -hmm. But you have to weld them on, right. on the with the plastic, the poly Casey welder, and YouTube has all kinds of great videos. But before I'll you, just come in here. <laughs> well, but but they'll show you how to do it on the YouTube videos. Right. It's great. Yeah, very simple. Yeah, that was a, a very um, good question, and a lot of people I see have scratches, and they they're very concerned about having a scratch in their boat. But I tell them it's that's that's what happens. It's part of it. Yeah, you know, industry. and that's really funny because you and I have had so many kayaks and we've scratched them up and I don't even care. It's Tupperware to me. Yeah. That boat is just to get me out in the water. And that's what's so great about, you know, any of the Hobie kayaks is that you've got a well-built hull that's easy to repair that's if you do need to repair it. Mm -hmm. I doubt you will. Yeah. I Especially on some of the newer styles like the um, thermoform. Thermoform kayaks are so different because the density of the plastic is way higher. And so like a cup, uh, one of the boats we make that's uh, thermoform is the Passport. Yep. It is crazy how much that can be abused and still not even have nearly a scratch. Right, it's crazy. right. I, and I don't, that's, a, that's one I'm not familiar with patching because it's only been out a couple years and, and we just haven't. That. 
I don't know what, I've never seen one take a ding. That's right. Yeah, and that might be another part of the future, it's thermocorn kayaks. I know it's seen a lot of eyes as a cheaper version of a, a real kayak. Well, they can't mold it as pretty. They can't get those lines like some of, the, like the Paul Angler and the, the new Outback. But it, if you're not just aesthetically looking for curves and things on the kayak, it's pretty, it's pretty solid. Mm -hmm. I, I really think that that passport is uh, uh, something that we can build on. Yeah. I'm hoping that that's what Hobie's yeah, looking at. Will happen. Yeah. One day. Well, I never, it never ceases to amaze me what you guys come up with. Uh, Scott Cox asks, Ron, can you install a Sea Keeper on my kayak? <laughs> <laughs> hey, after being on a Sea Keeper with Pete the uh, last couple trips, man, I am spoiled. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> so we need a Sea Keeper on that bad boy. <laughs> one day. That you never be know. Crazy. That yeah. would be, I mean, there's so, thinking about the future is, is hard to do. Because who would have thought we would be able to turn a propulsion system like the Mirage Drive? A 360. A oh, I would have never. When I got on those that. first prototype boats, my jaw just dropped. I said, oh my goodness, you can go in and come straight back out at almost full speed. Right. How you do? Instant reverse. Yeah, yeah. Phil. Phil is here. Oh, and we thought we were good on him. When Phil was turning and going around, oh yeah. man, another that Weaving was in around pylons. That was a game changer. We just went, oh, <laughs> we're not that good. Um, so, what are the minimum accessories you recommend for a kayak fisherman? Um, is it just a PFD or is it? Yeah, I, I, and I really think wearing a PFD is a great idea because if you go over for whatever reason, maybe a power boat got too close to you or whatever it was. Uh, if you go over, you want to be grabbing your stuff. You don't want to be swimming. You want to be grabbing your stuff and floating there. Right. And what I mean by stuff is a rod that's maybe starting to drop down. Maybe it's a tackle box floating away. So I always think wearing a life jacket is good. I think one of the other really good accessories is just a phone case. Because if you get into trouble, your phone can be your GPS. It can be your you know, call 911, it works. So it's a great little safety thing. Hey, look, I'm in trouble here, I'm 911, and they'll call the Coast Guard, they'll call the lifeguard, whatever. It also, it can be a GPS to tell you where you are if the right. fog came in. Mm -hmm. So the phone, a, a phone case is so inexpensive. So that's a great safety. That is, that is a very good tip for- You know, and when guys start to venture out off of La Jolla and, and doing bigger trips, I mean, who, I mean, life jacket, you know, compass, phone has a compass in it too. Uh, those kind of things are really great. And, and uh, you know, VHF radio, if you can afford it, because then you can call boats up that are right in your area. Um, I think then you start to get into bilge pumps. If anything ever broke on the boat that would cause the boat to take on water, you could pump it out with a bilge pump. And they cost all of $19. Another one is everybody loves going in the bays and, and you know, being like fishing along in more crowded areas. So get a flag. But we've made some really nice little flag for the, the boats that goes in and it has reflector tape on it and it's orange. Just so you can see, we just did a boat parade and we were amazed, amazed at how hard it was to see the kayaker. Particularly when you're coming in, you know, when you come in from fish and bluefin, you're tired and you're looking down that channel and some guy in a kayak in the middle that's got a camo boat, a camo hat. <laughs> I mean, it's very hard. Get an orange flag, you know, just visibility. And I think it's pretty much common sense. Yeah. But those are the ones that come to mind. Those are great tips. Great tips for a person that's getting started in, into kayak fishing. Um, well, it's it's uh, it's done. We're, we're down to the last uh, five minutes of our um, interview. And uh, I'd like to give you a few minutes to make some comments, your last remarks, and uh, whatever you got. Well, I, I would really like to thank CCA for being my advocate to fight for me against a lot of useless rules and things coming up. I, I want to thank those guys that run it. I mean, Wayne and, and our, and our direct, our, what's our director right here? He's doing a lot of work too. Right. 
I mean, the whole board is very um, proactive on making sure they have the best interest for us. And I students. like the fact that they're at all the boat shows and that they're at all the events, you know, drumming up interest to advocate for our fishing rights. I just feel bad that we have to start, we have to quit being just going out and fishing and enjoying it. We have to start to fight for our rights. Otherwise, we're not going to have it. And that whole 30-30 thing that's coming down, I don't, I think, I think that's gonna be a battle. I, I like your point about um, they're not gonna give you back your rights. They're only gonna take more away from them before. That was uh, very true. In a lot of ways it's happened already and it's happening and- Yeah, politics has invaded our sport. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's face it. They're after closing things down whatever that power grab is, I don't understand it, but they're there. And uh, there's a lot of money on their side, not so much here. And I don't, I think fishermen shouldn't be in La La Land. I think we should start to pay attention. Mm. I mean, I'm guilty of La La Land. When I go out there, I don't want to think of these things, but I think we need to, as a group of a group, get behind CCA and support them. Um, well, thank you very much for, for being a, a, a very um, influence, influence, influencing person in the kayak fishing community and advocating for people to get more involved. And I know that um, it's a lot more to do it than to say it. So, um, you know, you're proving that out there to people to get into the game and to do some research probably is probably a good step to take to make sure that they know what they're talking about. Um, but certainly, uh, yeah, I'm sure that um, a lot of people in, in the same place that I am in the kayak fishing community would, would uh, mimic what I'm saying about you being an advocate for and a leader in what we do. Well, we've we tried to grow the sport. Um, so, one last question from one of our CCA listeners here, Carrie Sherwood. How much experience with your Kobe should you have before heading out to the kelp beds in La Jolla? Uh, that's a really great question. I always say that you need to get two or three times out in the bay to learn the boat, to learn the mirage drive, to learn how it turns, how tight things need to be before you go out. Now, that being said, I don't think you should go out when the waves are big. And what I mean by big is anything over two feet. It's just too big to go take your brand new boat and go off. So I think that when you sit at that shoreline, you go, oh, no problem. That's when. Now, there's all kinds of ways to make sure you don't mess that up. Surfline has a live video right on La Jolla Shores. You can see how big it is. You don't need to go down there with all your gear set up and go, no, not today. And for the guy that goes down there and has that little feeling in his stomach, should I be doing this? You probably shouldn't. Mm. You got to say, I got this or go in the bay. But you know how many times that has a lot to do with your uh, experience with waves, currents, how they move down there and your boat, how familiar you are with your boat. Now that may take some people 10 or 15 times in the bay. It may take, two times or one time. But that's something that you have to come to grips with. Can I do this? And if you're questioning it, wait till another day. Okay, I think that's fair. <laughs> when it's meant to be, it's meant to be. <laughs> yeah, and then there's not a thing wrong with hiring a guide. Do you know any guides, Kevin? <laughs> maybe, maybe one. <laughs> no, I know there's actually four of us out there who are all you know, capable guys, and I've been doing it for uh, since 2011. So it's I've had nothing but a blast taking people out there that have never even, even fished in their life before right. half the time. Well, you've taken several of my friends and clients out for their first time and put them on yellowtail. Mm -hmm. I'm just amazed. <laughs> well, we need more of those people out there to step up their game to support CCA to make sure they're out there doing the same thing that we're doing here, which is talking about it. So I want to make sure that everyone out there that's following in the feed, you're doing your job too to spread the word. Make sure that you're following. Make sure that you're out there telling people about what's really happening in the political fishing world. They may not mix, but you're in it. And I think, I think that, that uh, with some help from guys like Ron 
and from our board of directors and from a lot of the leaders out there in the industry, we can do a lot more to protect ourselves in this state. So thank, thank you, Ron. Oh, thanks, time. Kevin. Thank, thank you guys for joining us. And we'll see you next afternoon with someone else in our industry.